while you're expecting, you know, to develop a relationship with a VC that actually comes back a second time and even a third time and everything, mainly VCs that you have chemistry with that actually listens and understands. On on Robert front front, what are you looking for when you think of okay, here are you know what Louis Tetu, uh, Charles Sirois, Andre Chagnon, what did they have that kind of like triggered your uh, interest of actually backing them? In some cases, more than once. I would say uh, passion. Yeah, that's the the I think the the thing that uh, struck me when I met all those guys. You know, and the the passion that they have for their product, uh, not just the product, but the the customer. Because you know, you need a customer when you got a product. If you don't sell the product, it's it's nice to have a product, but you need to sell it. But the the passion that they have for that business was, I think, the most uh, important thing. That uh, okay. And how did the relationship? continue to evolve because uh, in 2005, you filed to go public, IPO. Uh, that's a tough decision because before filing to go IPO, especially when you have a, a outperforming company, M&A offers starts coming in and knocking at the door. And when you actually file, other type of discussion starts, starts up. So what's the trigger and what's the process to actually decide to go IPO and actually push it forward from no, the entrepreneurial case, front first? In our case, uh, actually, the M&A offers didn't come. They came much earlier, uh, and they were tough to turn down in, in some instances. But uh, um, in 2002, uh, Monster.com, TMP Worldwide in New York, um, uh, the, the CEO uh, called the meeting at his office in, in Manhattan and, and basically offered $150 million for Taleo. Um, and we were what we were going on to, you know, 25 million sales or something like that. And um, you know, it's it's like. Uh, but I think to Robert's point, we were we were so passionate. I can assure you that the decision to say no was an instant decision. It was it was. I didn't even think about it. Uh, I looked at him and I said, unfortunately, you know, this is not the right timing, and we're not for sale. Um, and you know, I think it was a good decision, but uh, you know. Could have been wrong, but you know, you never know. So, but it, the passion, um, uh, I think, uh, lets you look at the long term. You know, when you meet Charles, you realize that he's got a long term vision, and 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 I think that's what we have for our businesses. It's the same thing that we have going on at Coveo today, which is the absolute conviction that this is going to build a big business long term. And so we don't get bogged down by, you know, there's a saying that, you know, when you don't know where you're going, there will be a lot of people along the way to tell you. And uh, and you don't want to, you know, if you know where you're going, you're not going to listen to all these people because, you know, most people tell you it won't work or, you know, you should sell or you should get out or you should, you know. And, 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 and our passion is the long term. It's not the short term gain. It's not even, frankly, financial in many ways. Um, and maybe we have that luxury. But, you know, it's, it's, it's really that conviction that we're building something um, uh, meaningful. So when we went IPO, back to your question, um, it wasn't so much an M&A thing and et cetera. In hindsight, we took Taleo public one year too early, in my view. Uh, you know, we look at Taleo, we say, okay, almost $2 billion, nice outcome, and, and et cetera. The reality is, frankly, very candidly, I look at LinkedIn, and LinkedIn is worth 10. And I think Taleo could have been LinkedIn. Mm. Uh, so, you know, because we had that vision of creating a talent marketplace, et cetera. As a public company, it just changed the entire, it just mm. changed our world entirely. Suddenly, your board meetings are not about you know, how you pursue your term strategy. Our board meeting, which I started to write B-O-R-E-D as opposed to B-O-A-R-D, uh, is about governance and not getting sued and, and, you know, the whole bunch of stuff that doesn't add value to the world in my view. Um, you know, and, and, and so we could not pursue, we could not make investments the same way, we could not pursue the, uh, our ambitions the same way, so to speak. Um, but, you know, the, the decision to go public is also heavily driven, whether we like to admit it or not, by, you know, funds and people around the table. You know, we had General Catalyst, we had Bain Capital, and et cetera. Um, you, know, you know, they're looking to exit. They also have their own agenda with their LPs. They love to show off that exit, and et cetera. In general, I think VC funds have a, a, a short-sighted view 
of the real cycle that it takes to build a real big company and materialize a big asset. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's three to five years. I think it's five to seven to eight yeah. years to build you know, a significant amount of value. When you think about it, Taleo took 10 years. Mm -hmm. you know. Yeah, absolutely. And from the investor point of view, like how did Telesystem actually entertain the whole idea of not selling, building the company, and then actually going IPO with, you know, Charles is the first one that's going to say, like, oh, a publicly traded company changes the whole game, right? So. It was it was a great great news for us. You know, it was our, our first IP, IPO in the in the portfolio. We were a Quebec-based uh, venture fund, uh, going Nasdaq. You know, it was just great. You know, I was <laughs> very happy with the decision. The the only thing was, you know, that uh, when you go IPO, then your position is uh, is uh, lock up for six months, and you pray, pray the Lord that the stock will hold. You know, <laughs> because you need to sell after. You know, so. <laughs> but uh, in the case of Talu, was a pretty good. Uh, I think we the, the the IPO was at twelve dollar. I think uh, Louis fourteen. Well, we've sold at uh, an average of twenty five dollars, so it was pretty good. Okay. That's good. Uh, so afterwards, I mean, uh, you stepped down from Teleo and you started becoming an investor as well. You were already an investor beforehand as an angel investor. So how did, how did you look at your transition, stepping down from Teleo, and what kind of brought you into Covio? Yeah, well, there's a couple of things. Teleo, first of all, when Bain Capital invested, it came with a, it came with a, um, a, a little, um, a little uh, requirement, which was to transfer the IP to the US. Um, which is a pity. The other reason was that, if you recall, at the time, the fiscal laws between Canada and the United States didn't facilitate the, the cross-border investment, which I has, understand was... Has was, been resolved. Has 16. been resolved, but it was, it was a real messy situation from that perspective. So anyway, company beca you know, ended up becoming um, an American company, and when we went IPO, uh, we were the, the, only, the only IPO that year in the, uh, the Inc. 500, um, you know, to, to get out, and um, and we were very very visible. We had 21 analysts following us, and you know, more than 10 million dollars of, of Taleo stock was traded every day, and, and etc. And so, you know, when when that happens, you need to be visible. So at one point, um, you know, there was a requirement uh, that uh, if I was going to remain CEO, I moved to the U.S. And frankly, you know, this is mostly a Canadian audience. I didn't want my kids to be Americans. Um, so that's just the reason. Uh, the other reason is, is you, you, you know, that's our, our game. Our, you know, my game is 550, 500. It's more 5, 100, 500, but it's, you know, I, I get bored after five years. I get bored after 100 million bucks of revenue, and I get bored after 500 people. And it's true. And I told that to my board. Uh, Robert's heard that before. I love the game, the initial game. I love to start you know, at zero, sweep the floor and, and just build a team that's energized and et cetera. Whenever you get to 500 employees and so on, you know, you get politics and, you know, all that stuff. Um, and, and, you know, that's, that's another. And, and, and at the time, um, uh, Larry Ellison had bought PeopleSoft and uh, Michael Gregoire, who's a Canadian, uh, was COO of PeopleSoft. And so I went and met Hi Michael and I said, you know, would you like to become CEO of Taleo? You're in San Francisco and et cetera. So I remained chairman of the company for a number of years after that and uh, initially very active. And then, you know, after that, then uh, kind of phased out. Um, you know, being on the board of an American public company is it's just another, it's just, it's, it's crazy, you know, with all the, you know, you get class action suits for no reasons and you get, you know, it's, it's a highly regulated environment. You're constantly surrounded with attorneys and, and et cetera. So, uh, you know, the guy, the guy suddenly, you know, I, I used to be on the phone with my customers the most of the time, and suddenly I'm on the phone with Mark Bertelson, who's one of the founding partners of, of, uh, of Wilson Sonsini, you know, five hours a week. And, uh, and, and that doesn't make sense. Didn't work for me. Uh, so we just made that transition. It was very easy. Um, and then, you know, invested in, in Coveo, and then, you know, now half of the executive team of, of Taleo has moved over to Coveo, and, and we're just, you know, bringing the band together again, and, you know, <laughs> that's it, having fun doing it, yeah.